our process was to include uh, a large uh, um, segment of faculty from across every unit in the institution in discussions around what is the proper role of online learning in a, a research university. That went on for a, a, at least a year, just the discussions just went on for a year to get to the point where we had documents that were shared, that were agreed to, uh, where there was a lot of input and a very democratic process. I think that creates a firmer foundation for building buy-in and then engaging in further discussions. Um, we're going to be having discussions with deans next week about uh, where we should be going, where they should be going, how are they going to grow online learning, what, where does it fit within their particular units and, and their departments. And uh, So I think that it starts with uh, conversations that need to have a lot of voice. So what we're trying to do is bring something else in that disconnects some of those traditional system things, right? So it disconnects a professor, disconnects um, maybe any of the other things that would add cost to it, put it into a delivery format that you can scale so you can have one person doing it or 3,000 people doing it. It's not going to cost you anything differently, right? And then charge only what it is going to take to do that, okay? Not the full scale like, you know, here's the professor cost and here's all this other stuff. So literally what you can do with it is you can take it down to this very low level. At the year 2000, 70% of college operating costs were funded by states. Uh, from state subsidies. That has now dropped to about 35% of college operating costs. So that's a big gap to make up and one of the reasons why tuition dollars have ex gone up so much. But then that's led to higher student debt and it's coupled with you know credit card debt and other economic issues that uh, may be occurring here in this country. So how can colleges remain in operation if there's only so many tuition dollars you can get out of the existing student populations. Each college sort of has a, uh, a maximum number of students that they can support with their you know, physical infrastructure. That's kind of motivated the uh, adoption and looking into online degree programs and offerings and how to tap into online students that maybe are not the traditional students that would be typically filling classrooms in physical campuses. It's really where our students are right now. They, they, the, their phones, their iPads are a part of their life. And if we want to, to communicate with them, if we want to participate with them, we're going to have to speak their language. And technology really is their language. Technology also helps expand our classroom environment beyond just the three or four hours a week that we have them. Outside of that, we can include things like a discussion board, uh, videos, um, where you, that's when you start getting into a, a flip classroom. Flip classroom meaning you do your lecturing and your, your content outside of the classroom, and when they come back, you work on problems and, and other questions and issues that they had about your lecturing or, or information they, they did outside a classroom. So the, the, it's been flipped. I oversee e-learning with the Tennessee State and what I have in my hands are two tools that your campus will have if you're going to use e-learning. I have my laptop and right now that's the number one device in terms of using a tool for online teaching and learning. However, guess what? We all have a mobile device. In the future, students will pull out their phones to take a course online. With that, my job is to make sure we have quality standards for online teaching and learning.